Right, as we look at the, the whole context of sustainable information corporate governance, one of the things we picked up on a little while ago was the problem of the inability of the IT world to deliver projects on time to budget and either being delivering all of the signed up for functionality or delivering business value um, from the Standish Group. One of the areas we need to think about is project risk and benefits management. And it's, it's something we've been struggling with for uh, in the industry for 30, 40 years, maybe longer still, 50 years even. And we still don't seem to be doing any better. So we need to start thinking about what's going wrong. Now I just want to sort of go to some slightly um, amusing perspectives that we've been seeing over many, many years. And if you go back far enough to the beginning of the 20th century, a guy called Sir Josiah Stamp, who was the governor of, of the Bank of England <clears throat> at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, and he also was the person who set up the British Rail workshops um, here in Derby, right at the beginning of the rail, well, at the beginning of the main part of the railway systems. And he said something rather fascinating. I will read this out because it's up, although you can read it as well. Um, it's kind of interesting because it also has a, a sideways look at big data analytics based on statistics. And he points out that the government is extremely fond of amassing great quantities of statistics. And you go to the Office of National uh, Statistics and they're producing data uh, all the time. These data, these statistics, are raised to the nth degree. The cube roots are extracted and the results are arranged into elaborate and impressive displays. You know, dashboards and infographics, uh, posters and so on. What must be kept ever in mind, however, is that in every case the figures are first put down by a village watchman and he puts down anything he damn well pleases. In other words, the data is inherently of uncertain veracity. And when you look at some of the data that's collected by the government from big businesses, they send a request for data to somebody senior in the organisation, say the uh, chief executive, and it's passed down and down and down and down the line to somebody who looks after data and statistics often. And I won't say he puts that, he or she puts down just anything that they please, that, they, that pleases them. But it may well be that the data is uncertain. It may be that the data is uh, coloured. It's a perception rather than the facts, or even if it's the data from the uh, mainline operational systems, it still needs interpretation before it can be used effectively. So the data that we are capturing at high levels often requires lots and lots of interpretation. If I go back to uh, ERP systems in the, which were being implemented in the late 1990s, <clears throat> one of the ideas was that because we've got this one repository, this enterprise um, reporting system that covers everything, all properly linked together, then when we press the button at the end of the month, we get all the consolidation and we get all of the data in a single place, a single view of data, and we can rely upon it. It turns out, however, that this is not entirely the case. Because at the departmental level, yes, there's a whole lot of data, but it needs interpretation, and often it needs a few extra items brought in to give them really up-to-date, the stuff that hadn't quite got caught by the system, but is actually vital to understanding the position of the company at the end of that month. And so what's really needed is extract the data out of the mainline systems at the lower levels, put it into spreadsheets or other budgeting or analysis systems, bring in the extra critically important data, add it in, do the analysis, then consolidate it to the next level up, and the whole uh, st thing starts again. A few more items at the higher organization levels, which are absolutely fundamental to getting a really good understanding. And so over a period of weeks, 
10 days maybe, you've got this adjustments going all the way up. Just because of, in a sense, because of this. We put stuff into the operating system just to get stuff recorded, which might not be understood by the analysis systems either. Now in terms, there are, there's another one I want to show you before we get started with the other ideas. Um, I think we'll go for this one. This is rather fun. <clears throat> and please do not be too offended by the language in it. It's uh, some of it is a little bit coarse, with very very specific reasons. And this actually is a very interesting perception of the changing way, or ch a good understanding of the changing ways different levels of an organization understand their reality, their perception of what's happening. So it starts off with the idea of an IT project. In the beginning was the plan and then the specification, the requirement spec, you know, the thing that starts off the whole project. But the plan was without form and the specification was void because, hey, we didn't really know what we were going to be doing. And darkness was on the faces of the implementers thereof, and they spake unto their leader. This is the project leader. It's a crock of shit, and it smells as of a sewer. This project is terrible. We really, really don't like it. We think it's going to be a disaster. But the leader took pity on them and spoke to the next level up, the project leader. And you'll notice that they're changing the words as well. It's now a nice, polite word. It's a crock of excrement. And none may abide by the odour thereof. So the first level a uh, supervisor is talking to the project manager here, and he's being polite. And he's already changing that perception from it's absolutely disaster and there's nothing good about the project to, well, it's kind of a bit politer. And the project leader spoke to his section head, his, his uh, manager. And you'll see how the two lines keep changing. Not a crock any longer. A crock is in English means it's a broken container. Now it's a proper container. And none may abide by the odour thereof, and it is very strong, such that none may abide by it. And the section head hurries to his departmental manager and informed him thus, and see how it's now changed from excrement or manure to um, fertiliser changing those perceptions from it's a catastrophe and absolutely disastrous and now it's something that makes things grow but it's a very very strong fertilizer and then it goes up the hill further still up the organization to the general manager who says and he says there <clears throat> it containeth that which aideth the growth of plants which is what fertilizer is and it's a very, very strong fertilizer. And so we now see the next paragraph here. And so it was that the general manager rejoiced and delivered the great news to the vice president. This project promotes growth and is very powerful. And the vice president rushed to the president's side and joyously exclaimed, this is a powerful new software product and will promote the growth of the organization. And the president looked upon the product and saw that it was very, very good. And after the subsequent disaster becomes, of course, it wasn't that at all. It wasn't a, a fantastic new software system. It was a complete catastrophe. We didn't know what we were doing. We had no plan. It was going to be a challenge or a failed project. And after the subsequent disaster, the suits, the people at the top of the organization protect themselves. 
by saying, I was misinformed. And the people at the bottom who were really worried right at the very beginning were demoted or fired. Now, that's a very harsh view of projects. But there is much more than an element of a small element of truth in the way that all of those changes happen level by level. And I've seen this when we've looked at uh, various uh, research has looked at the different <coughs> perspectives of the success of a project from the people at the very bottom, the ones at the very beginning of the story, who, and, and you see across the bottom, uh, levels from uh, the beginner, the sort of bottom end people who are trying to implement things, across the bottom row, the axis of up to chief executives and so on like this, across that. And on the axis, it's just, you've got their perceptions, success or failure, or desire, completeness or likelihood of success. And it's a bathtub curve like that. On the left hand side, catastrophe from 10 to 0, and on the right hand side, from 0 to 10, success perspective. And so as you get more and more senior, the level of perception of probable success or actual success rises and rises. And on the left hand side, you see how the doers are seeing almost no likelihood of success. Catastrophe, just like this. So what is going on? It's kind of an interesting a way of looking at this. There's another, there's a nice little web page here, uh, which um, <coughs> sorry, links across those same sort of wordings, but adds in this beautiful set of um, examples of what different levels of management, different parts of the organisation see the project as being. And here, there's a, a lovely little diagram that was That's right, here's the start. An interesting novel sort of swing. And you go through all sorts of different ways of doing it. Now, I'll leave you to look at this one. It's a link there. And that was all that the customer wanted, just something nice and simple. And we see this overblown uh, complications often. Because the real end user, the real customer, doesn't really get their message heard. So with all of that, let's now have a little look at what might be going wrong. Or the things that we need to be thinking about very carefully as we think about project risk and benefits management. Three different ways of looking at how to manage the system. The key issues are what I really want to concentrate on, but I want to, want to just look briefly at what the BSCIT is all about. If you go back to the second, your second deal, we did IT services management, and we looked at the top two levels of the Zachman Enterprise Architecture, the planner and owner levels. And in parallel, in the sec your first semester in the second year, you did IT product design with Dennis Parks, looking at the designer and builder levels. And then with databases, you also looked at the bottom two levels, which is turning it into real things. But IT, BSC IT is very much involved right at those top two levels. And <clears throat> just remind you what the Ed Zachman Enterprise architecture looks like. You've got those six columns which ask the, provide questions. So remember, questions are the important thing here. Things about what, how, um, where, who, when, and why. Those six questions, which are what those ones you need to ask about every situation. And we're looking at those two here in BSCIT. So if we look at what the BSCIT is all about, it's, we're really thinking about the design side, whereas computer science, networks and security and so on are all involved in the building of things. Your role, more than anything, is design. 
interfaces, aesthetics. Technology is a secondary issue. Yeah, I know that when you're doing SAS and R and uh, Watson Analytics and so on, you're getting involved with some of the technology. But we're still much more interested in how all of those deliver real value, real insights to the people who are your customers or yourselves if you're the customers in analytics. So, for today's topic, we're looking at project and program management where we have to think about getting things organized, planned, laid out, organized in a realistic sort of program with realistic uh, estimates for benefits, realistic estimates of quality, cost, resources, time, and risk, and so on. And it's the responsibility of project and program managers to give their very best estimates, to be realistic, not optimistic. They mustn't fall into all of those biases that Daniel Kahneman talks about in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. The things that we always get wrong, we're always optimistic that this time we're going to be successful. I know we've had these failures in the past, or we've not been terribly successful, or we've had this rather rosy uh, tinted glasses perspective that we're doing pretty well actually, when in reality we're not so successful. And um, you know, think about Standish Group reports. So we've got to get that right, and the program manager must be strong enough to try to resist the pressures from above to reduce the budget, to reduce the time scales. Otherwise, they will certainly be challenged projects, and if not, or if they're not uh, outright failures. So, the first little question that you're going to work on once we finish this introduction is to find some definitions of what is project program management, what is project management, and they're different. I want you to use academic sources, web resources from the professional organisations. Uh, you'll find different organisations out there for project managers, for program managers, and they'll give you some definitions. Pick up those sources, record them in your working bibliography. But having done that, think about what are the fundamental differences between program and project management. And what are the different, different key tasks in each of those areas? You could also link this discussion back to some of the guidelines that came out of the Standish Group reports about how big a project has to be, to be or how small a project has to be actually, to be successful. And you'll remember that very early on in the chaos reports, they pointed out, and it's never changed since, the projects with a total value of around about 10 million US dollars, uh, more than about six to 12 man months, uh, months of sorry, tw six to 12 months of project, are likely to be challenged, if not failures. So connect between the Standish Group reports, uh, and you find those easily, and this particular part. I want you then to move on, having got this idea between project and program, and sort that in your heads. Find five different approaches to project management. That's dead easy because there's about 15 of them. And you might try starting off with Wikipedia because Wikipedia gives a quite a nice overview. But that doesn't go into your uh, bibliography. But it will lead you to lots of different uh, sources, resources, all about different ways of doing project management. Now, having thought about that, <coughs> what are the most different, uh, important differences between those five? What circumstances are they useful and successful? And in what circumstances don't they work? Because out of this reflection, this thinking, this critical analysis, you should individually be able to come up with uh, an appropriate project management approach for your specific project that you're looking at, or your specific approach to using this big, unreliable big data. 
I also want you to then start thinking about this problem of risk management, benefits management, and uncertainty management. Find ideas about all three of those. Because they give you some interesting thoughts about should we be doing the classic risk management approach as mentioned in ISO 27002 as one of the pillars of uh, governance and is used very, very widely across almost all forms of project management. But we know it doesn't really work very well for a whole lot of reasons and Bruce Schneier has lots and lots of uh, articles about why we aren't able to assess risk terribly effectively or to understand it in context. So research those three areas and again build up your working bibliography because there's some rather interesting ideas trading those three concepts in terms of answering this uh, assignment. And as your critical evaluation of these three different approaches, ask yourself, what are the strengths and benefits of each different approach? What are the drawbacks, the weaknesses? And are there any opportunities that are presented by any, either, any one of these three approaches? Are there any threats to the way that we actually operate or think about life? And there's a couple of books in the library, um, and you may be able to get uh, excerpts, again, through Google Scholar with a bit of luck. Okay, any questions? Does that kind of make sense? Okay, good. Well, get to it, guys. Uh, do work through each of those sections, and every now and then we'll sort of have a little group discussion as we go through the different sections, okay? I want to have, you know, do some research, do some thinking, and then have a little discussion with each other, and then we'll have a group discussion. Okay, folks? Thanks very much.